true. As I look at the title of the conference, I think, is there a logical discrepancy? Evolution after revolution. I hear a lot of voices who say that revolution is not over, or that revolution has not reached its aims, or some who ask, was there a revolution? So my first question to the panelists is how sure you are that it's time, the right time, to discuss evolution and when it will actually start, when the revolution will be over. Each one of you has 30 seconds to answer this question and I'd like Valeria Gontreva to start. 30 seconds. I remember that uh, song uh, about Soviet time song that revolution has no end. And that's why I, I think that re, uh, it's all philosophic items, uh, revolution against evolution. I think we're, we're going uh, ahead, and uh, it's a still revolution, and a peaceful revolution. Jan Tomlinski, head of EU delegation to Ukraine, ambassador, the floor is yours, 30 seconds. Evolution is always uh, cheaper than evolution, uh, so I would advocate very much uh, for an evolution, uh, uh, because uh, we all are part of the evolution of nature, so we have to continue this work without making too much revolution. Chimel Fan, Country Director for Ukraine, Belarus and Moldova, World Bank, year 30 seconds. <clears throat> the revolution started because people in Ukraine were fed up with corruption, they were fed up with the lack of opportunities and jobs. So I think the revolution will end when people feel that they have equal opportunities, there's no corruption, or less corruption, and that their living standards improve. And Metro Shemkiv, deputy head of the presidential administration and also chairman of the executive committee of National Council for Reforms. 30 seconds. The world, is the world is evolving in exponential terms and in any industry, in any area. So the exponential development in our society will continue. We've seen it with the Maidan development, we've seen it with today's development uh, in the way how we discuss coalition agreements and moving forward in politics. We need to see the exponential development in the same way in Ukrainian society in terms of implementation of reforms. The title of the first panel is rather longer than the title of the conference. It says, the choice was made, but will EU integration really become a crucial driver of reforms? Well, I'll probably dwell in a, a bit of detail about this when I will be asking Jan Tombinski to speak. But first, I would like to ask a question of Mr. Shemkiv. You know, I like very much, well, I'm trying never to miss your briefings at the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center. But uh, one of these days I got the news that now they will be happening not once a week, but once a fortnight. What does this mean? Less to report? Or are you already on reforms? Or are you already on a well-planned and well-paced path of reforms? Current authorities reform action plan. Who will implement the reforms? What can and should we expect from Ukraine's new parliament and government from your point of view? As we are rather pressed on time, not more than five minutes, and then the other panelists will be able to comment. In order to implement the uh, reforms in the country, we're not talking about only DCFTA, implementation of Europe, DCFTA with the European Union. This agreement is, is, is needed, but not enough. There is a set of reforms that are not listed there, or referenced in the agreement only as elements that need to be implemented. I'm talking about um, court reform, I'm talking about uh, anti-corruption efforts and so on. 
There is a set of areas which are not subject to the reform, to the uh, agreement. When we're talking about the plans, we're looking at the plans on three different levels, and because we have here the invested people who related to the investments, and when they look, you look through the plans, you always look on the tactical level when the management of the company's organization deliver a very clear set of things they have to do now, as well as the strategic thinking. That's why we're looking at the implementation plan on three different levels. The first one is a tactical level. It's things that has to be done now. And that's why the coalition agreement was developed, which lists a set of a very concrete steps in different areas uh, that has to be developed within a year. It has at certain deadlines within, with distributed by quarters, it's distributed by industry. The second level is operational plan, or uh, recovery plan 2015-2017. We're developing it jointly. Uh, it's developed by Cabinet of Ministers by uh, Mr. Groisman, jointly with uh, Presidential Administration, jointly with the European Union. Uh, and this is a document that needs to be ready by 15th of December. It also has a very concrete set of plans with very concrete set of KPIs to be delivered. And it needs to be, uh, it outlines the plan for three years. So it's three year planning. Uh, when we go further, it's a more strategic horizon. We're talking about strategy 2020 presented by the president. We are fin we are final we finalized uh, 25 KPIs we need to achieve in order to qualify for a membership in the EU, not be a member but qualify for membership. There's a very clear set of KPIs to be delivered. Uh, one of the KPI we have the support that World Bank will help us to uh, develop. But th that focus, strategic focus, will be used as a beacon to which the all efforts that are first in the coalition agreement as a very concrete steps to be achieved, these are the ones. And the key benefit of coalition agreement is that with one agreement we're shooting uh, two rabbits. One is uh, it's the coalition in the parliament. We need parliamentarian and deputies to vote on the set of initiative because a lot of reforms need to go through their laws. The second is the government, because in Ukraine there is two ways how to change set of the things and introduce reforms. It's decrease of the government and laws in the cabinet uh, and laws by the parliament. I wonder, I wonder if you, uh, why are you talking about shooting two rabbits instead of catching two birds in a bush? Well, it's just, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Just directly it's just that rabbits, so, so rabbits so come to, to mind. Yeah. No, so it's not that. that. To no. Very Ukrainian. Sorry. Are you all? Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, we heard about expectations uh, of the new parliament, coalition agreement and government, and I think it's time for Mr. Fan to say what current World Bank programs expect from Ukrainian government. Briefly, please, because you will have additional time to extrapolate. I think the question is not really what the World Bank expects from the new government. The question is really what the country needs. In my view, first of all, you need to stabilize the economy. You need to stop the decline of the economy and stabilize the banking sector. But let me say one thing, and this is actually one thing I think you can, with one stone you can kill three birds, not just two. And that is a reform of the gas sector. In my view, that's got to be the number one policy priority of the new government. The current, for the first three quarters of this year, the budget deficit is just about 2% of GDP. The deficit of Nyefta gas is more than three times as much as the budget deficit. So it's a huge burden on the budget. And who is benefiting from the current situation in the gas sector with the low gas prices? Whenever you have multiple prices, you have huge opportunities for corruption, and a lot of that is happening. People argue that low gas tariffs to the households are good for the poor. The data does not support that. In fact, the top 
40% of the population gets more than half of the subsidies in the gas sector. So it's actually not good for the poor with low tariffs. It creates corruption, but most importantly, low tariffs discourage private investment in domestic gas exploitation, and I think you've all seen that. It stops foreign investment from coming in, and most importantly, these low gas tariffs undermines Ukraine's energy security. So I think with tariff increases and restructuring of Nyakta gas, you can actually kill three or even four birds with one stone. The stakes are rising. Uh, Mrs. Ontario, what uh, kind of uh, financial reforms are expected from the new parliament by the financial sector, by the bank? <coughs> Of course, we, we, we already prepared a package of uh, uh, new projects of new laws or uh, some um, correction of existing laws. And uh, but you know the main problem of our country is not uh, a bad <laughs> legislation. It's uh, it's a poor court system and implementation of existing laws. Uh, we still believe that, uh, uh, of course I can count even uh, very concrete steps, uh, not uh, only uh, talking about reforms, you know, like a general one. For example, protection of creditor rights, uh, which I mentioned in my keynote speech. Uh, it's, uh, for, for example, right now we also changes to the legislation of national bank law. Uh, different type of changes, uh, frankly speaking, a lot. And, uh, for example, uh, in civil court, we'd like to change some definition of term deposits, because right now in our country, term deposits doesn't mean, unfortunately, term deposit. It's like an overnight deposit, because it could be called in one particular day and without any commitment from customer to stay for term or special term with this bank. I can count a, a lot of very specific items. Uh, but, of course, the priority is uh, protection of rights of creditors, because otherwise, if you uh, see what's going on in uh, our uh, legal and court system, it's absolutely incredible even to, to imagine. That's why it should be in parallel. Maybe we will improve uh, our legislation, but we, have, we should have a real reform in the field of our court system. All right. I sometimes am amazed at uh, how Ukrainian politicians view the European Union as a kind of a kind wizard who can do almost anything for them and almost anything instead of them. I'm very glad that Mr. Shemkiv mentioned that some of the reforms, and quite huge reforms, are not uh, still, uh, well, not uh, there in the association agreement because when some Ukrainian politicians were discussing the coalition agreement, they said, well, we actually don't need the coalition agreement. It should be just a couple of phrases, fulfill the demands of the association agreement. So I think that even from this, we understand how important the word of the EU ambassador is for us, and his view. My question is uh, also connected to the word deadlines that was used by Mr. Shinko. I always shudder when I hear this word, deadline. It's scary. I'd rather talk about lifelines. Is there a lifeline that EU is ready to throw to Ukraine? if the situation becomes too somber and uh, is the association agreement the complete reform plan? Mr. Kambinsky, your five minutes. Thank you. And I will start with almost the same words as Eximov. It is not the 
that Ukraine needs reforms because of the association with the European Union. It needs for own sake. And uh, the last year shows how dramatic is the price for neglecting the elementary reforms and neglecting the needs of building up a resistant, sustainable state and economy. Therefore, the reforms are needed for Ukraine. The association agreement is not a panacea. It's not a remedy for all the pains of Ukraine. It's only a list of engagements on both sides. And this is why I wish also to stress what you've said, this lifeline. This is an engagement on both sides, because uh, there are two parties to the contract. Uh, one hand is the political will, determination to reform, for own sake, because we will be also the European Union better served by having a good neighbor, a neighbor whose uh, economy, whose country is uh, contributing to the general international system and not only asking for assistance. Therefore, this is where the European Union will also be a beneficiary of the uh, success of Ukraine. And uh, uh, the European Union is there with uh, financial assistance, technical assistance, and with uh, all accumulated knowledge from different crises. We may tell a lot of things about the European Union, but what is shown, this is an accumulated knowledge how to cope with crisis. 28 European countries, knew all kinds of crises. Once again, Timo Fan mentioned this sector of energy. We made the calculation two years ago what it does mean the deficit of NAFTA has for every household in Ukraine. This 2.8% of deficit generated by NAFTA has for the state budget in 2012 meant that average household in Ukraine paid $200 to NAFTA has without being asked whether people would wish to do so. Taking the whole energy sector, it was almost four times the bill to pay by every Ukrainian household to energy sector of Ukraine. And I don't know in Europe, with one exception, Serbia for the time being, a country where big gas operator generates a deficit. Usually, they are best payers to the national budget. And this is not an abstract science, what we put in this association agreement. This is a compendium of proved practices, what to do in order to get to a sustainable economy. But signing it is not the, the end of the story. What the Ukraine failed over the past 20 years was implementation and having multi-annual strategies. This will be, we manage with this association agreement as also a living document, because it is also a document that uh, will be uh, updated and uh, uh, will be adapted to uh, uh, different needs. But if we achieve to create a, a long-term strategy, then probably Ukraine will be well served by implementing and doing what is needed for Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kotreva, are there any specific banking requirements in the association agreement that you, in financial, I mean, in the financial sphere, that you as governor of the National Bank have uh, difficulties to, in coming to terms with? Absolutely not. 
Uh, well, uh, you know that Ukrainian banking system is, frankly speaking, in line with uh, IFRS, with international legislation, uh, accounting principles. That's why this year we will implement uh, the final tuning of these IFRS accounting principles. That's why we, I think we are ready. Mm, of course, we, we need a strong banking sector to be ready to join uh, Europe, but according to um, Legislation, we are more or less okay. May I ask you a naive question? Please. Yes. Uh, you say uh, we have to have a strong banking sector. Is strength in numbers? I walk to my uh, work every morning, or pretty much every morning, and week in, week, week out, I see more and more banking affiliates, banking branches on my way in Saksansky Street. Is this a uh, indicator of the good health of banking sector? You, you see more each day? Yes, yeah. every week, every week, not yeah. every day, uh, every week. <laughs> of course, it's even strange because according to the number of banks right now, it's minus 26 banks and we compare it to the beginning of this year. And, uh, and when we are talking about branches of uh, these banks, uh, uh, as far as I remember, uh, maybe minus 30% branches of the biggest bank around the country, that's why. And uh, if we uh, remember, of course, Premier uh, would completely close our banking system. Uh, in the Donbass region, uh, this particular uh, auto region, we, uh, we, we prohibit uh, we prohibited uh, the banking system to work more than three months in a row. And why they are opening new branches in Kiev, uh, I think, uh, no idea, but uh, I, I see the different direction, I see uh, the... Maybe we we'll walk, maybe we we'll walk different streets. Okay. <laughs> uh, but among all those new names of banks that spring up in uh, different corners of Kiev and our country, there is the bank. Everybody knows them, although they don't have bank branches. The World Bank. I can and tell you that we registered zero banks in this year, zero. And uh, also we increase uh, because the Ukrainian banking system initially was 181 banks. It's, believe me, more than enough for Ukraine. And that's why we increase uh, the capital requirements uh, before it was 120 million hryvnias. Right now for new bank, a new capital uh, should be 500 million hryvnias. That's why it's closer to the uh, European uh, banking system and I think we're in line and also we introduce a special uh, law which obliges all shareholders to increase their minimal capital capital in 10 years to the, uh, this 500 million European standard. This is a very uh, good news because this shows that we have 10 years at least. For but for new banks, uh, of course, during the crisis, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to order. Uh, we need uh, banks should be uh, recapitalized properly. But uh, it's not time maybe for us to uh, uh, increase uh, all these capital requirements right now. But for new banks, if you'd like to register as a new bank, you're obliged to uh, inject five. Well, I hope that you use you figuratively. I don't have such plans. Okay, Mr. Fan, uh, the role of the World Bank, of the programs and support that many Ukrainians expect is very important. And if you would be so kind as to give us a brief overview of what the World Bank is now offering, but at the same time, what are you expecting? Thank you. I'm very happy to tell you what the World Bank is doing here. Uh, but let me first make the point. Ultimately, it's the Ukrainians who have to manage the economy. And they have to own the policies and they have to implement the policies. International institutions like the World Bank can help. And we are helping. And I would add that I think in the current crisis, international assistance to Ukraine has been unprecedented from 
not just the World Bank, but other international financial institutions, the EU, and other bilateral donors. So there's a lot of support that has been coming in. But what is the World Bank doing? We're doing a few things. First of all, we are supporting the government to undertake structural reforms to stabilize the economy and to stabilize the banking sector through our budget support as well as policy advice. Second, we are financing investments in improving public service delivery. We're financing investments that's improving water supply, sanitation, roads, hydropower, the transmission system, health, and the social assistance system in the country. Third, through the World Bank's private sector, um, the International Finance Corporation, and our guarantee agency, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, we are making direct loans, investments, and guarantees to the private sector. So we are supporting the growth with the private sector, and uh, as Attila in his opening speech mentioned, ultimately the country can only be stabilized, can only grow with private investment, both domestically and internationally. So it is critical that we work on all these fronts, but ultimately it's the government that has to undertake the much needed structural reforms. And frankly, at this point of the crisis, that a more comprehensive, a bolder reform program is going to be critical to attract more international support into the country. When you're talking about government, do you mean uh, uh, all the branches of power, like both the presidential branch and the, uh, the government, the cabinet of ministers, or specifically the cabinet of ministers? Because in Ukraine, when you say the equivalent for government, you mostly, we mostly mean the cabinet of ministers. Uh, you, you're absolutely right to correct me in that. In fact, no, no, when I'm I say, not correct when I said uh, um, government in this particular case, I meant much broader. I do mean the the state um, uh, apparatus, the administration, and that includes first of all the cabinet of ministers, but also the national bank and the presidential administration. Clearly, the reform program is so comprehensive and requires a unified voice and approach from the various parts of the state. And this is particularly important in a crisis time like today. Thank you. Mr. Tumbinsky, Mr. Ambassador, what's the EU program for Ukraine? Are you going to offer us more than you have already offered? Are you going to demand from us more than you have already demanded, or let's say requested? I will start with a partial answer also to your previous question about who should be in charge of reforms. There's one of the questions of the association agreement does not give an answer. The constitutional setup is also something that should be addressed by Ukrainian legislator in order to make a clear division of power in the new constitution. And the new constitution is also something of paramount importance for decentralization, uh, judiciary, uh, and uh, other systemic reforms uh, for Ukraine. What the EU is doing and uh, uh, what uh, EU may offer more as uh, the assistance to Ukraine. It's difficult to uh, enumerate all the sectors the EU is uh, involved in. We may only say that the EU is not involved in uh, hard security sectors, but in all other sectors EU is involved as uh, advisor uh, and uh, in assisting with uh, uh, different uh, 
financial budgetary support for Ukraine. So this is a, a, a very large scale of engagement. And this is also an understanding in the European Union that this call of the people of Ukraine we wish to open this European perspective for Ukraine. It's an obligation on our side. But uh, you may nation on the Ukrainian side to run through the program of reforms. How do, you, how do you measure determination? We measure determination mostly through implementation, not through uh, adoption of legislative acts. We had a variety of acts uh, uh, well uh, written, adopted, but uh, remaining a uh, dead letter. The question is to set policies, to implement, implement, implement. European Union is uh, implementation-based community. And this is the main difference in philosophy. In previous times, in previous years, under the previous government, we had a lot of promises, a lot of uh, good words, but uh, the deeds didn't follow. So there will be time now for this, and I guess not because of uh, uh, the because of the expectation of the European Union, because of expectation of Ukrainians, in order to prevent a real Ukrainian revolution. This is there will be the highest cost to pay for the country if the situation gets up to the point that people will really say we are fed up. People were not at the revolution. People were asking for evolutionary change. Yes. People are wise. Some might say that uh, revolution is different from evolution by the presence of letter R in revolution. And R may stand for this big capital R may stand for reforms. And maybe we are talking about evolution because we do not want reforms very much. And I mean not only the authorities or the government who are often accused of lack of will to perform reforms, but Ukrainians themselves. We would like to see someone come and do reforms for us. Mr. Shinkyu, what's your perception as the head of the Council for Reforms and as deputy head of uh, uh, presidential administration of what you heard just now from the World Bank and the European Union? But maybe, just maybe, you'll find also a, uh, something from Metro Shinkyu as if he were not the Deputy Head of Presidential Administration and Head of the Council. Thank you. Um, I think that the credibility that we receive from the West and from the Ukrainian people is pretty high. And it's draining it as well pretty fast. We had eight months, uh, pretty moderate uh, success. Uh, yes, we have a war, uh, but war is not an excuse. It's happening on the 5% of the territory. There is 95% territory which still can is economic driven um, when we analyze we try to analyze what has been done again it's not much so that implies that the next government has to do twice as much as the current government it's going talking about deregulation we're talking about real reforms real reforms is very simple it's actually project management Anybody who did any project in their life, even in school, you make a list of what you do, you put deadlines, like, well, I still use deadlines, uh, you put deadlines, you, then you track execution. It's a simple basic of management. You don't talk, you do. Um, unfortunately, a uh, majority of the political environment in Ukraine used to talk versus do. Uh, and we need actually more people to do. Uh, if we're talking about the CFTA, it's very, very practical things. There is a set of economic things. I think 173 is about economy, economic things. It needs to be implemented. But when we introduce, in, um, and I know that uh, European Union wanted to have a ministry, 
the same way that um, it happens in Poland, the same way it happens in the Baltics and others. We introduced a department within the Secretariat of Cabinet of Ministers, which is dealing with European integration. That's a message. I don't think how many people, I mean, 20 people is responsible for European integration, it's a joke. If we're talking about 173 things, just in economy, that implies drafting things. It implies understanding and working with IKEs. It, respect, it expects actually to go in deep and working with the European Commission and defining very, very clear steps. So, and that's why when the, some of the ideas were going around the coalition agreements and, the, and plan, we need to have a proper level of it minister which will execute across the board uh, and other ministers will listen to it. If we look and, and when we look into the, and I, I, I try to analyze where the pitfalls is, when we try to analyze how the current cabinet of ministers function on the current law, this law is just unfunctional. The, 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 way, the procedures that are defined there implies that uh, ministers are in many cases are depowered or not even empowered to make decisions. It should be always a consensus. It should be, if you want to make a decision, you have to agree it with all other members, otherwise you cannot move forward. So this is, needs to be addressed and changed. I still want to go back to the, to the question you asked about the, the trust that we're getting and support that we're getting from European Union and World and IFI. The trust is really big, and I can tell because I'm meeting a lot of the colleagues every day, and I hear their complaints. If I would not be deputy head of the presidential administration, and that would be my company, all the people who are dealing with the project with the World Bank will be fired. Very, very simple, because they are not capable of just structuring projects. When we analyze, when we look through the documents, if the document about project on the healthcare is not aligned with the project which is done in the NAD ministry, this is something wrong. And you're sitting at just across a few floors. It's not about non-willing, it's useless bureaucracy. Because currently, if we put the country at the state, if everybody, if every bureaucrat will have in the mind the country, not themselves, not their positions, not their future, but their future of their country, will have absolutely different. And I know how difficult it is for Valeria Gontreva to make changes in the National Bank of Ukraine. It's 10,000 people who doesn't want to change. When you go into the Ministry of Economy, it's 1.2 thousand people who happily would like to see anybody who comes in to be thrown away. These majority of the government officials do not want to change. So when we get a small group of people who go going into the change, we're looking forward for a strong support. When we go back to the question, is the public support? So when we go to the public support, if we try to, we, I look through the polls about gas price increase. So we all talk about energy independence, but 60 plus percent of Ukrainians don't want to increase the gas prices. What, who reads these polls? Politicians. What items is a big subject in the coalition agreement discussion? Is the gas price increase. There is a strong position to it, to put it in, to increase, the, to bring it properly. There is a great business plan developed by NAFTA Gas how to actually reform the system. And there is a strong push, like let's wait, you know. Even the reform of NAFTA Gas in the coalition agreement by politician put in Q4, by Q4 2015. It's not acceptable, it should be Q1 2015 or even December. We need to announce the process now. So all these things needs to start happening. And I'm looking forward that the new government, the new parliament will be much more aggressive on the reforms. And the support from World Bank in you is unprecedented. Really unprecedented. Some people come to me and say, we would like to actually do more work. But I know I, I'm not gonna. One of the group that is from EU is trying to get to one of the ministry. And one of the ministry said to them, until new parliament ratifies so much agreement, we cannot allow you to sit and work with us. I'm not joking. That's a meeting yesterday I had. It's what? It's, it's what? Oh, we, we can't follow that procedure? Come on. It's your country at stake. No, I need to cover my... If the new parliament and the new government are more aggressive, as you say, uh, don't you feel that the president may, be, may fall a victim to this aggression. 
and the presidential administration as such. I <laughs> How cohesive is now the coalition of the future coalition, the cooperation within different branches of power? Uh, we need to get to the unity and the, and the cooperation. Um, somehow, the majority of the population and media is still uh, not referencing to the new constitution. It is very clear distribution of power, as you reference. Uh, there is a, a big chunk of responsibilities today with the cabinet of ministers. And the cabinet of ministers, um, in many countries, usually reports in the crisis mode. They usually report regularly to the public what's happening. Um, it needs to be, I, I've seen so many reports that uh, MBU is doing now, and I haven't seen much reports doing by Ministry of Healthcare, or Ministry of Energy, or Ministry of Economy. I, I would like to hear some statistics. No, I receive statistics, as a, as a, because there's some procedures to report, but I'm also receiving, we would like to stop reporting, or summarizing. Well, I'm very curious, and a very simple thing, we're receiving a lot of financial aid, or financial support. The Ministry of Economy has a very clear set of things that has to be reported. There is a department who tracks that. It's a uh, multi-donor support uh, tracking. There's many, many projects. It's a project, actually. I would like, I'm asking the audience, who've seen one of the reports of that institution on all the projects that are done by donors? No, I've seen. Raise your hand. Good. No. It's actually very detailed. It's like big, thick. Uh, and this road construction, we actually receive credits for the road construction, and we still, uh, they nodding because they are funding that. And I'm seeing, you, I, there's even uh, pieces of roads that have been uh, constructed. Uh, there is a report on what is constructed. I'm curious if any activists will go and check, because I'm not sure the Ministry of Economy went and checked that road. So we need to go, there's a very, very detailed list of projects, and we need to introduce accountability to everybody in the government. Uh, and government broad perspective, reporting what's going on and transparency. Mr. Shimkiu said that 20 people who are responsible or are supposed to be responsible for European integration and the Secretariat of the Cabinet of Ministers is, of course, a ridiculous number. To use Mr. Fan's word, ultimately 46 or 44 or 41 million Ukrainians should be responsible for European integration, should feel responsible for European integration, and should do something in this respect. But some of them are, of course, in a better position to do this than an average Ukrainian. And talking about the integration or participation of Ukraine in the world financial structures, I think that Valeria Gontreva can tell us expertly, is it going to happen at all? or when this is going to happen, and how? What will happen to what, the exactly? U Ukraine's uh, becoming an integral part of the global financial system. Ukraine already is a part of global financial system because, you know, because of globalization uh, and because all multinationals, uh, big multinational companies uh, already uh, in, in Ukraine, it's not, uh, you can count Coca-Cola, uh, McDonald's, uh, or Procter & Gamble, uh, all, all of them are there. And uh, I'm absolutely not uh, support any protectionism, but believe me, I, I consider that we need more local uh, companies and producers right now. Because if you see the impact and uh, correlation between uh, devaluation and inflation, uh, it's absolutely incredible, incredible number. Because right now inflation reach uh, more than 20%, and to the end of this year it will, will be 25. And it's only and, uh, and during the recession period, you know, it's absolutely. Uh, uh, incredible numbers and it's only because of our 100% uh, uh, linkage to uh, uh, export and import economy, absolutely open economy, means that we need to, to, to have more and more uh, local business and producers uh, here. That's why 
Ukraine it's globally integrated perfectly together with our financial markets. And unfortunately, our uh, financial markets, you know, the biggest name of uh, all our companies right now in the Warsaw Exchange, for example, in the London Exchange, and uh, unfortunately we have only few companies there, only because of uh, we need to, to uh, help to grow local business to be there. And that's why we're quite integrated, but we need to develop local business and of course to present better this business. What's the role of the liberalization of exchange rate in this? Right now, you know, liberalization, uh, liberalization of exchange rates is really very painful for all our economy. And again, it's only because we were not prepared. Uh, when we discuss, uh, for example, uh, even in Russia, they always uh, try to create some special program for, uh, uh, for all this, uh, to, to stop uh, increasing imports. Whenever we declare all the time all these ener energy savings, we declare all the times all these uh, import uh, changes in coverage, but we never do, uh, unfortunately, we never did anything in this direction. And that's why finally we face the music, you see what's going on with our inflation, only because of uh, all this import uh, of goods and services. That's why, uh, uh, because of we are uh, really integrated uh, and globally integrated economy, I still believe that we need to support of our local industry. Thank you. Mr. Fang, do you have a comment about this? Ukraine's uh, role and place in the global financial system. I think in today's world, Ukraine is already very significantly integrated in the global market, not just in the financial markets, in terms of trade, in terms of investment. Um, you asked the question of whether exchange rate liberalization is sufficient. It is not sufficient, but it is absolutely necessary. Let me just give you one number. For the first nine months of this year, Ukraine's current account deficit was only 2.5% of GDP. For the same period last year, it was 10%, four times as much. For the very simple reason that you have the flexible exchange rate that has helped the economy to adjust much more quickly than on the fixed exchange rate, which was the case last year. In fact, for the first nine months of this year, imports, imports declined by about, I think it's 20, 25% um, year on year compared with the same period last year. And you've only had a 9% decline in imports. That has helped the economy to adjust much faster. Frankly, without a flexible exchange rate, I think it would have a much, much more difficult situation in the country today. But what else needs to be done? Clearly, I think um, one of the governors uh, Priorities at this moment, obviously, is the stabilizing of the financial system, banking sector. So there needs to be continued effort um, to restructure and to recapitalize some of the banks, cleaning up, really, the banking system. As the governor mentioned earlier, you had a lot of really uh, banks that are not really banks. They use for money laundering. Some of them are simply corporate uh, treacheries or what's called pocket banks. So that system needs to be cleaned up to deal with the stock problem. Going forward though, I think you need to have clearly uh, give the National Bank much more legal tools and authority to supervise the banking system better in terms of having more transparent shareholding ownership and governance in the banks and much more stringent entry requirements for new banks as well. Clearly, we need to develop the non-bank financial system, the equity market, the debt market, in which many of you 
working. Clearly, in the end, the banking system alone will not be able to provide the needed financing in the economy. You will need to have equity, you need to have debt instruments that, so that the companies can access financing in the long run. Ultimately, if you don't have a functioning financial system, economic recovery is going to be so much harder and economic growth is going to be so much slower. So it is absolutely essential that we use the crisis and here I do want to disagree with our Turkish speaker. I do believe this is an opportunity. It is an opportunity in many ways. I'm not sure you have that many other choices. You, this is an opportunity during a crisis to clean up the banking system and put in place some of the more fundamental requirements, the infrastructure, both the legal and the institutional infrastructure for the financial system to grow. Thank you. We're nearing the end of the panel discussion and uh, after I guess some three to five minutes, you will have the chance to ask the panelists your questions. Are there people with, who will be working with microphones in the audience? Well, please tell, um, please tell them to be here in three minutes. There is a uh, very important question still to be discussed by the participants. The revolution of dignity, which happened, or some say has not yet happened in Ukraine, of course was about dignity, it was about European choice, it was about democracy and all this kind of stuff. But it was also about the desire of people to live better in material terms. And against the background of what's happening for different reasons, for objective reasons and some subjective reasons in the country, there is a uh, huge feeling of dissatisfaction among many so-called average Ukrainians which uh, of course poses the question that the war and its after effects, are they going for many, many years to stall the economic development of the country, which may lead to prosperity of the common people? Ambassador Tambinsky, you said that, and I agree, in this with you wholeheartedly, the EU is a compendium of experiences. Is there a quotable, a citable experience in the European Union where prosperity went along with the securities, tangible securities, a threat to security? How can we learn from you or at least find some hope from you in this respect? It will be hard to find uh a similar experience uh, that Ukraine goes uh, now through. The war is uh, this uh, biggest obstacle to reform and it is also the biggest problem uh, for your country because uh, in every country security goes first and the security is uh, the prerequisite for investment and for this psychological element of uh, every economy and uh, we know that uh, investments need perspective, investment needs time and if you are in a situation of a war you don't have such a perspective to plan therefore everything is done very spontaneously. But there were examples of reconciliation of overcoming the past. But to your specific question, whether democracy, uh, I would not say that uh, there was such a revolutionary change in Ukraine uh, from uh, uh, comparing with uh, what uh, we uh, went through in Central Europe, from communist uh, to democracy. But our experience was that the democracy doesn't bring necessarily immediately economic welfare. This is a, a long-term investment. And uh, 
the message that I would say, that I wish always to pass the Ukrainians is trust yourself. You also may manage the change. The period will be painful. Two, three years uh, are going to be painful. Don't promise to the population easy time. Time will not be easy. But uh, if people wish to be statements, they have to think in longer categories. So the reward will come if there's a strategy and if there's a real political will to implement. But one disclosure, the war is uh, this huge, huge obstacle to embark on this path without having this second thought that security goes first. But what I was always very struck with, also before this war, this lack of trust in own forces, that Ukraine is also in a place to, in a good position to operate the change. Trust yourself, take the risk and embark on the future. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Does anyone want to take a minute to comment on this, Mr. Wanna, Schindler? I just want to add, because probably Jan don't want to mention, but I think Poland is a fantastic example of this. Uh, and it's true, it didn't take, uh, it took quite a while for the changes in Poland, but actually Poland was one of those countries who implemented reforms, went from the point which was much deeper than Ukraine today, from economic standpoint. Yes, it didn't have war, and the majority of the countries didn't have war, but we also can look at the Croatia as an example which the country went through the war, and how they rebuilt the army, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, those who traveled for vacation in Croatia can, can see the difference. But that country was in the war. So it's a question about actually speed of implementing and understanding the consequences. I, I talked to Leszek Barcerowicz and uh, he was, I, I can't say, condemned for the first few years uh, in, in Poland for his initiatives. But today every Polish, Polish person will thank uh, him for what he did then, by back then, changing and reforming. Agribusiness was strongly against him on the first day of the reforms. Today, it's one of the biggest and fastest growing business in Poland. Just to give you an example, and we need to understand that there will be popularity which you need to sacrifice, we all need to sacrifice, uh, for the painful change that needs to happen. The flexible exchange rate is absolutely crucial for the country. Absolutely crucial. And the people who today run National Bank of Ukraine sacrifice in a lot in their personality, in their life, sorry. That's reality. And, that, and the same thing with the fighting for peace in the East. So it's a lot of sacrifices taking place today, and we need to give respect. But we also understand that the middle class and, and average Ukrainian will demand fast changes. It took Georgia 36 months to change police. 36 months before they've seen the first results. Thank you. So now we are going to take two questions from the floor, please. Yes, give the mic to this gentleman and another person who wants to be in the queue. Uh -huh. No, uh, the press will ask their questions separately. You will have time and place where to ask them. And then uh, the mic will go there. Okay. And hi, I'm Ilya Parkal from Dragon's Transfer Society. So I have two short questions to whoever wishes to comment on them. First one is, do you think Ukraine should restructure its debt? And the second one is, although all kinds of help from the international institutions has been unprecedented, the amount of financial help we actually got was, you know, maybe enough to not starve to death but definitely not enough to kickstart the economy as, and so on. So do you think if we succeed with some reforms, it should be drastically increased? Okay, thank you. So whoever wants to ask. I'm from financial sector, maybe. Uh, first of all, mm, about, uh, you, you said about restructuring of our debts. 
you know that we have a standby program, IMF standby program, and also a World Bank program. And uh, repayment of our debts uh, uh, were envisaged in the, this uh, standby program. That's why uh, Ukraine pay in time all their debts, uh, public debts is here. Uh, Ukraine even uh, helped to repay uh, not NAFTA gas uh, uh, Eurobond, you know, for 1.6. Um, uh, also by this program envisaged repayment of our years to Gazprom, and you know that we have a special account uh, within a national bank uh, Gazprom account and right now we are obliged to repay these arrears to the end of this year. It's 3.5 billion dollars. That's why uh, we, uh, uh, all of that envisaged and uh, international community all the Ukrainian debt. And uh, I think it's very early to discuss uh, uh, all of that because right now on the program, uh, as I explained to you, uh, all repayments of our external debts uh, are there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we always are talking about how to increase uh, international health. Uh, but and, uh, we, we, everybody try to criticize that the program of IMF and the program of World Bank is uh, really small in size. I can tell you that we utilized uh, and we uh, took from this program only 4 billion, 4.5 billion. That's why it's even 17 billion, it's still in, in this program. Uh, let's uh, use it and let's utilize, let's uh, show our real efforts to do reforms uh, and maybe after when everybody sees that it's going on, all this reform is there, uh, money will be there as well. And please show the projects, uh, because when we are talking about only, uh, yeah, we, we need some money, we need money for, for, for something, for example, for rebuilding of Donbass. But first of all, we should understand what kind of, uh, who, to whom belong this territory, where is this, all these political uncertainties. I, I, I think uh, it's more or less about that. And second question was about... Should the amount of financial help be drastically increased? Should, should, should we get more money? Ah, okay, yeah, but I answer your question because, because of this uh, assistance. Because, you know, program is a program, and also we will have a conference of donors. Uh, and recently I met with Mr. Soros, he was about two weeks ago in Kiev, and we discussed all this donors' preparation of donors' conference. He is a great supporter of Ukraine, and the main discussion of us was the kind of projects we have what kind of reforms we will implement. It's all, all of that link. And uh, I absolutely uh, sure and uh, truly believe that uh, when we have a real pass of our reforms and projects, we will get international support. Okay, Ambassador Tombinski wants to add that message. For the time being, we are talking mostly about public money coming to Ukraine in order to help the financing the system of the country and uh, the state budget, but uh, this uh, public money, pub assistance with public funds will not be enough to change the country. This is only a kind of insurance in order to create space for private investment. This will be the driver for the economy, but uh, this is what uh, is to be done and to be created within the country with this assistance of public money to save public finances, but then to create space for private financing. Thank you. Mr. Shinkin. It's a question uh, what for we need the money. Let, let me be frank. Uh, what we are missing today is very often the project description. Do we want money to patch the holes in the budget, but at the same time draining the money through the NAFTA gas and not reforming NAFTA gas? Would you, as an investor, support such kind of drain of the money, understanding that you're not seeing any recovery? No. So then the question is, what are the projects? And the whole idea about donor conference and the plan is actually to identify the projects where we need money and where to invest. Because it's a, it's a seed money that will help to finance uh, the system. So we need projects. It's true, there's not money. But even for those projects that we have projects <coughs> described, we're missing the project team who will, and I know that uh, World Bank will support me on this. On some of the cases, we have money already allocated by World Bank. It's, it's a millions of dollars. I would say hundreds of millions of dollars. And we could not 
prepare a project plan. Okay, project description. Describe healthcare, 300 plus million dollars. I'm not gonna talk about energy sector. How much money is there? Um, I don't wanna disclose, but on one of the case, World Bank was calling me asking our team to help somehow to, to fix something in the cabinet of ministers where we have no influence. To get the documents to push the, the negotiation on some of the agreements started. We received it on Friday night, 700 pages. Negotiations should have started on Tuesday. This is about the quality of work. If, if we're really seeking the money, we need to be much differently engaged in the process of actually requesting the money. We should not be, sorry, but this is Ukrainian. Uh, we shouldn't be Panikovsky, Daimilov. We need to explain what for we want this million. Thank you. All right. And the, as they said, there are more than one way of skinning a cat. And not only Dai Million was Panikovsky's tool, but there was also Bogano who wanted to rob Kareko. And then Bender, who by very delicate means succeeded in getting a million from Kareko. Okay. And the question. Valentin Kaklov, CFA. I have a question to Valeria Kontareva. Before you entered the office, you were uh, saying right words about uh, relieving currency control and regulation, and it hasn't been done since you were in office, and about uh, removing obstacles and barriers towards uh, free movement of uh, capital flows into Ukraine and out of Ukraine, which has not been done, uh, so you were advocating flexible rate and in the position of governor of national bank, you were putting administrative barriers actually to exchange, to paying, uh, making payments of, in foreign currency uh, outside of Ukraine. And uh, also, and the question is, and the question was why there are such discrepancies about what you were saying and what you have done actually in the position. First of all, there's absolutely no discrepancy, and I try to explain all, all the time what we are doing. Uh, first of all, I'm still committed to flexible exchange rate. I'm still a great supporter of idea of uh, inflation targeting. And believe me, without this precondition, I will never even join National Bank because uh, no needs to stay with uh, this uh, old history with uh, uh, fixed exchange rate. But you know, for what, uh, when we are talking about flexible exchange rate, we need a flexible exchange rate is exactly to find the competitiveness of your uh, for competitiveness of your economy uh, could you uh, tell me when uh, what uh, phase of our uh, military operations happened in the end of august and beginning of september when the, uh, before this uh, ceasefire agreement was signed and we know that uh, because uh, our enemies not succeeded in these uh, military operations they start to destroy uh, our uh, industry physically they destroy our infrastructure could you imagine how the, any flexible rate uh, at any level could help Yanakovsky Metallurgicheski Zavod or Alchevsky Metallurgicheski or uh, this Avdeevka Koksahim or, or others, I can uh, tell you uh, 100 names, how they can help uh, 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 how this flexible rate could help them. And uh, the main idea why we decided right now uh, to, to try to find some equilibrium, uh, only because we have a better projection of our GDP than before. Even when I went to Washington in the beginning of October, our GDP forecast was 9%, and right now I told you it will be minus 7.5. It's, uh, for the, this short-term period means it's times better. If we predicted that, uh, for example, our uh, balance of payment uh, will be negative because of the deterioration of all these export revenues and proceeds, and right now, uh, even from only from Alchevsk steel plant, 
Uh, we have a monthly export uh, proceeds in the amount of 180 million dollars. If you have no any proceeds and what kind of rate could help you with all of that? And uh, it's from economic point of view, it's from fundamentals part. But panic of population, what you can do with all panic of population? Panic of population could really create uh, and ruin your own country. For example, if uh, uh, absolutely uncontrollable exchange rate and exchange rate went through the roof, it means a real huge hit on banking system. When it's a huge hit on banking system, you will tomorrow will not find any one bank to, to withdraw even your money from your ITM machine. It's absolutely different uh, stories. We're absolutely committed to exchange flexible exchange rate in a normal market condition when it's a business as usual model. But our model was not a business as usual, it's a wartime economy. And how we will compare? Right now, when we see some improvements, uh, we, we try to find some new equilibrium. That's why I'm committed like before. Thank you very much. Uh, we are almost at the end of uh, our discussion. And, you know, I'm very susceptible to repeating patterns. So when I saw that evolution is revolution minus one letter, I thought that I should try to get to know what goes after evolution. So I subtracted the first letter, E, and I did, found, uh, did find that there is a word, volution, which means a turn or twist about the center or a rolling or revolving motion. Revolving motion. You turn around, you're in the same place. My final question to the panelists is, where is the guarantee or a guarantee or two or three guarantees that Ukraine won't find itself in evolution after evolution? 30 seconds. Ambassador Tambinsky. There's never a guarantee. It depends on the political will and determination of, of Ukrainians. And I guess uh, you are the guarantee that uh, we will not uh, be uh, in uh, some time from now in this illustration of uh, uh, famous saying uh, about some revolutions. How much you should change in order that nothing changes. This is not, I guess, uh, the option for Ukraine, and I hope that you are the guarantee that it will not happen. Mr. Fong? You need the R, and that's reform. You need to undertake strong reforms, but the impact of the reforms need to be fairly distributed among the population. We cannot undertake reforms that negatively just impact the poor and the bottom 40% of the population. We need reform, the impact of reforms to be borne equally. And that means that we, as we undertake reforms such as raising gas tariff prices, we need to have a more targeted social assistance program to support the poor and the vulnerable. Secondly, the authorities need to communicate about the need for reforms and why you are doing it and how you are doing it. So communication is critical. And lastly, reforms need the support of everyone, and that includes each and every one of you sitting here as well. Thank you. Mrs. Gontero. I'm in the driving seat of these reforms. That's why 99% of uh, information about me in the press and television is negative. That's why I'm sitting there. I do reforms in the National Bank. We do. Uh, we have a very uh, detailed action plan for next year and uh, some strategy for next three years. And more to that, because I'm a member of uh, um, this uh, platform of reform, uh, we also have a special team of volunteers, and I, I'd like the CFA community also maybe join our team, and we prepare so-called Marshall Plan. Of course, it's a plan of reform. Unfortunately, I can also complain that 
No, I remember that only one meeting of this reform, high level reform committee happened in our country. That's why uh, sometimes when I'm preparing my, uh, for example, and my team preparing this plan, it's also frustrating that you are uh, writing all your uh, papers uh, to, to your table, you know, no, no, not to the real discussion. That's why uh, I really do all these reforms, and believe me, I really, uh, and my team and uh, National Bank team, of course, uh, has an absolutely clear view um, to what direction we are moving. And your main question, and absolutely agree with you, that uh, it will not be visible maybe for some period of time. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, everybody will be even frustrated that we are moving so quickly to this direction. But Let's see. It's like a certain and, job. Yeah, Mr. Shemkin. I think that the, uh, the key guarantee for the success of Ukraine is actually people in Ukraine. It's a civil society, it's activists, it's the media that's actually ensuring that the guarantee happens. Politicians tend to forget uh, they live in the very short time cycle of their airtime on TV. Or, uh, and the civil society and the people in their everyday life, they actually are the best guarantee of the things that are taking place. I want to thank you everybody who have been contributing. And I, I, I worked on many projects in my life, but when we discuss strategy 2020, when we discuss or, or currently strategic plan or even coalition agreement, the speed of receptive or receptiveness of the society to provide the feedback, the insights, uh, <clears throat> was an, an unbelievable. I actually appreciate that we got all this input, and then probably one of the toughest my job was to sell it to politicians to actually include it in their plan of execution. Um, sometimes somewhere we succeed, some somewhere not. Uh, but coming back, it's a civil society that guarantees the success. When we talk about National Reform Council, uh, the main reason why we kind of stop at certain moment the meetings because it's a parliament because the people who sit in the uh, National Reform Council, the cabinet of ministers, it's, it's members, it's uh, leads of the parliamentary committees, and I'm looking forward that there, there will be first meeting of Rada, there will be first the appointments of the head of committees, there will be appointment of the government immediately will be a decree of the president appointed because according to the presence of decree it's by name presence and actually we are thinking and uh, let me disclose that we're planning the national reform council will meet mid-december um, where the work done by for strategic planning and some of the plans under the coalition agreement will be presented and discussed uh, the last time we had this meeting was very extremely productive i think that and, and very honest um, i must say so I'm looking forward for the same uh, way of uh, cooperation. Uh, we work with the National Bank. Vlad Rashkovan sits in the um, executive committee, and we are fully aware of the changes and challenges that National Bank going forward as a lot of other areas and industries. But the only guarantee for us is actually us. Thank you. You know, I was counting some words during this panel, and uh, the number that the speakers used the word trust, and that they used the word investment, was the same. And really, these words go beautifully together. Invest, trust. But also, trust investments. Trust investors. Build trust. And so I thank the panelists, give, him, give them a big hand. I thank everybody here for investing their time so that maybe the investment in money becomes just this little bit more probable. And now you can spend your time, something like 15 minutes for a coffee break. Thank you.